Um, so today we will be joining uh, forces with the Europeana's new professional task force to explore um, new perspectives on the, the potential of digital technologies in cultural heritage studies, uh, including topics such as photography, advanced serving techniques, advanced software, um, and digital preservations. So we, today we have uh, four presenters, which I'm going to introduce in a bit. But I would first like to uh, invite Carlota, our vice president, uh, to say a few words. Carlota. Hello, um, thank you. Um, well, first, thank you to Kilian and to Europeana for uh, joining us today and for creating this, this opportunity to meet two different communities that have so much in common. And I think I speak for all that we're really excited to see what's going to come out of this. And also, we would like to really thank all the people that have joined ESAC since the last event and all the people that have joined our team. We have a six new team members in the last month. So thank you, Metali, Emilia, Chiara, Hilaria, Riley, and Giacomo. We are really happy to come with you. Um, and I just like to end with two news that we have released uh, in the past couple of weeks. The first one is the internship program, which we will do with, with Europa Nostra. You can read the details on our website and it will close in three weeks. Um, and the last one is that the, the topic for the December talks will be um, Heritage for Sustainable Futures. And um, the call for officers has just been released and I invite you to stay posted and keep up to date with our social networks to learn more and contribute to with, submit your abstracts for this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlota. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we are going to start this event uh, with our keynote speaker, Killian Downing. Um, Killian, I think you should be able to, to share your screen and your presentation with us. Okay, perfect. Then the floor is yours. No, uh, how's it going, everyone? Uh, thanks so much, Philippe and uh, Carlotta. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And uh, as you said, I think it's a kind of a melting pot of of different voices and people. And uh, this is really important. And uh, it's it's kind of great that uh, this kind of collaboration and kind of cooperation is is taking place. So um, I nearly had a meltdown about 10 minutes ago and I thought I was going to be late. So uh, thankfully I'm not. Um, I'm just going to switch over to my own notes here. Uh, just one second. Uh, okay, so uh, I see what I'm doing here, right. Um, so um, I am a, my name is Killian and I am an archivist in Dublin City University Library. Um, I have been a voluntary counsellor with Europeana since December 2018, so I'm quite new to the whole initiative. But fundamentally for me, Europeana is about kind of connecting individuals, uh, organisations uh, to make their uh, digital content available online and very much uh, for Ireland, where I'm based, it's been critical that all the kind of different types of uh, galleries, libraries, archives and museums are able to kind of federate and have a kind of um, a consolidation of, of kind of knowledge that's kind of shared, uh, not just to Europe, but around the world. And um, within that scope, then, I suppose um, there's so much kind of going on in the Europeana initiative in the, in the whole kind of landscape of it that you can get involved with. And I really have to say, for me, getting in on board, and initially it was kind of almost a little bit intimidating, but then when you can see that there's kind of six communities that are there uh, to kind of provide support to any kind of new members of the Europeana Network Association. Uh, it's really a kind of a friendly and open and kind of passionate space to kind of get involved with. Um, how I got involved in Europeana initially uh, was uh, just connected to a story um, I had uh, in my family. There was a kind of a World War I memorial plaque that was uh, connected to, I'll just fast forward to it now, to uh, this gentleman, Thomas Nagari. And we had this uh, memorial plaque in our family for decades and we didn't know who Nagari was. And what you can see on the right here is the, the kind of the bronze uh, uh, memorial plaque that was give, given to any kind of next of kin of any kind of personnel that were, were, that were kind of killed in uh, the First World War. 
Um, so I put this up online. I put this on the Europeana 1914 to 1918. And it was there for a year or two until the descendants of Megari spotted the name. Uh, they spotted the plaque and they uh, were in Australia and they connected their kind of uh, family all around the world in kind of the UK, in Scotland. And they were able to kind of make contact with me so that uh, my family could return this kind of um, uh, this plaque to them. And like this is, you know, really was a kind of a... Uh, a clincher in terms of how important uh, Europeana is, that it's it's kind of evolving into kind of a home for our uh, collective memory. And on that basis, you know, there's so much uh, more that can come out of this as people are kind of connected. So um, that was uh, just some of the newspaper kind of articles about us. Uh, but in terms of just one object having so much, uh, having so much impact, because um, the, the family of Magari, they never had a body to bury. He, he, he went down with the ship. And this was kind of a tangible artifact that they could uh, associate with their gran grandfather. Um, so this is, uh, these are the members of the New Professionals Task Force. And I know Georgia is here representing too. So uh, hello to Georgia. And we're very much kind of uh, involved with uh, ESAC now and we're, we're kind of listening together and this is really about a kind of a mutual um, awareness and development uh, in terms of how to attract support and kind of engage young and new and emerging professionals in Europeana and what we're kind of working with is is kind of the, the well the origins of this go back to yes uh, Lisbon uh, just last year where we had the Europeana 2019 conference and what kind of came out of that was really a recognition that uh, Europeana and the Network Association could do a whole lot more in terms of being uh, open and, and inclusive and relevant to kind of young and new and kind of emerging professionals and, and regardless of, you know, what their background is or, or what kind of field of study that they're interested in, uh, we wanted to kind of think about, well, how can we make uh, joining up and being involved as kind of uh, inclusive and, and kind of safe and uh, kind of in, uh, just, just a passionate kind of an experience. So we've been working with a number of um, organizations uh, uh, throughout this year um, during, during COVID and, and that. So it's, it's been kind of a challenging time, but nonetheless, I think a lot of people are, are kind of uh, happy to, um, you know, get involved and chat and kind of col collaborate. So I think, especially now, never, never has there been such a good time for kind of people and organizations to come together and, and just chat and talk uh, like we're doing right now. So uh, there are a few of the entities that uh, we've been kind of listening to and looking at kind of maybe relevant approaches that we can take back to Europeana. And one of the approaches definitely is ESAC talks and the other uh, ESAC activities, which really are kind of going out of their way to say to kind of new professionals, you know, we hear you, uh, let's make this happen. And out of that then comes new energy and new focus and then new meaning. So we very much want to kind of work with uh, ESAC and these other um, organizations to kind of uh, continue that and uh, kind of maybe review our approaches all the time and, and kind of taking a check uh, a self-check in terms of like where we're coming from and what our kind of perspectives and privileges are. And um, yes, yeah, so I think that's the uh, last slide uh, that if there's any questions or feedback or comments, uh, feel free to get in touch. Uh, we'd love to hear from anyone with any type of question. And the door is very much open uh, if you want to kind of get involved. And I'll send a link now just to the Euro European Network Association. If any of you haven't joined up already and, and um, that's it. So thank you. Thank you very much, Killian. Um, any questions maybe for Killian? Okay, and then we will we will also leave some room for questions by the end by the end of this meeting too. Um, I propose now that we start with our presenters uh, today. Um, our next presenters will be Ana Chiara Colombo and Laura Cerliani, uh, master degree students in architectural design and history at the Politecnico di Milano, who will elaborate uh, on two main survey uh, advanced techniques in the field of architectural heritage conversation. Conservation, I'm sorry. Good evening. 
I will share my screen. Yes, please. Okay, so good evening to everyone. As we said, we are Anakara and Laura, and we will uh, show you the application of uh, Telesia laser scanner techniques uh, to the case study of uh, Parasurucale in Mantova. As you may know, Mantova is a small city in the northern part of Italy, and uh, it has been inserted in the World Heritage List uh, since 2008. Palazzo Ducale, as currently constituted, is made up of many different buildings that are the result of a series of additions and alterations made over centuries to the uh, original medieval structure. The Survey Advanced Techniques course at Politecnico di Milano focuses on the application of static and dynamic terrestrial laser scanner to the architecture of the palace. The main aim of this research was to use the 3D survey of the two-dimensional metric data that we need in order to develop in a later stage the preservation of the project. The static terrestrial laser scanner uh, requires slow acquisitions with high measure accuracy and also high resolution. We used and applied this technique to uh, survey just a small portion of the palace that is uh, Palazzo del Capitano. The dynamic terrestrial laser scanner is a very fast acquisition. We use it just uh, for two hours and the final result that we get is uh, um, like a 3D mapping of the entire complex of the palace. As you may know, the terrestrial laser scanner is um, a technique that uses uh, uh, laser light to take and to get measurements. Um, the first step and the most important ones uh, is to set the parameters of the instrument in order to define the resolution of the acquisition according to the representation scale of the drawings that we need. Uh, in order to get the point cloud of that little portion of the palace, we combine more than 100 different scans. And uh, to do that, uh, we uh, overlap the uh, common points between different scans. That's why we use uh, the targets uh, to mark all the different spaces and uh, the main rooms of uh, the palace that we surveyed. This is uh, the final result of this process, that is the point cloud that can be seen and uh, used in the recap. Uh, the density of the point cloud expresses the resolution of uh, the acquisition that we had. Then we imported uh, the point cloud uh, in AutoCAD, we defined uh, a new coordination system, and uh, we set the section plane that we needed. In this case, our main aim was to get the longitudinal section of the Armeria and uh, the lower levels of uh, Palazzo del Capitano. So we started redrawing it uh, on AutoCAD and this is the final result that is the longitudinal section of that portion of the palace in 1.50 scale. The second uh, mm, uh, survey technique is the dynamic mode laser scanning. It is made simply uh, by a backpack on which uh, it is installed, uh, a laser scanner is installed and also a camera. Uh, the backpack is uh, linked to a laptop or, or simply a screen, a screen uh, on which uh, we can uh, see in real time, uh, we can visu visualize uh, the survey and uh, the point directly the point cloud. Uh, the density of points doesn't depend on, only on the characteristic of the laser scanner, but also on the, our working speed. So the lower we walk, uh, the, bet a better, the better resolution we will have uh, in the point cloud. Uh, in the first image, you can see the general survey that we obtained through two hours of surveying. And it's a huge survey of uh, a very big part of the historic center of, um, of Mantova. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you can see how low is the accuracy uh, and uh, how um, how less information we can obtain from this uh, uh, survey compared uh, with the first one. Um, but we can say that this kind of survey is not only useful to have acquire um, data from the single pieces of uh, uh, the architectures, but 
uh, especially to have a comparison between uh, um, the single parts that can be surveyed. And you can see here the, how we uh, um, elaborate the data and uh, how it is possible to compare, for example, the different heights in ground uh, of uh, the single parts uh, of Palazzo Ducai, that is a very, very complex uh, heritage site. Uh, so, if we uh, need to do some, uh, to say some pros and cons uh, of the static mode and dynamic mode, we can say the static mode is very useful in architectural uh, scale and survey, but uh, at the same time, it it, acquire, it uh, needs uh, a very long time of acquisition. Um, on the other hand, the dynamic mode is very fast and very useful to have a general image uh, of uh, a space, a place, but at the same time, we, it is not, um, we cannot apply it in every single field of architecture because we have a limited range of accuracy of this kind of survey. So uh, thank you. And uh, maybe uh, what we can think about if, uh, is that, uh, uh, do you think that these kind of techniques, maybe they can have a, a work, another work of field um, and uh, maybe they can, can be used in a different way um, in cultural heritage management because they are very, a very big and important um, uh, achievements in technology, but maybe we, we can um, also propose uh, other field of applications. Thank you. Thank you very much to both. Um, our next presenter will be uh, Seren Yusel, um, who is an architect and master student specializing in BIM heritage, uh, BIM architecture and facility management. Uh, and she will explore the relationship between digital design concept BIM and architectural heritage. Thank you for introduction. Good evening. I'm sharing my screen, I hope. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. You see it. Yes. Okay, just one minute. Um, okay. Uh, uh, good evening for the ones uh, who are not architects or who, who doesn't know about the concept of BIM, a small introduction. It is a design, a digital design concept derived from ISO standards and working with softwares like Archicad or Revit. And today I will talk about uh, exploring BIM for heritage. Uh, today, uh, BIM is a norm for many countries, in many countries, uh, due to its efficiency in construction workflows. Uh, but just recently, it has started to become uh, promoted for built heritage. So I'll, I'll try to uh, share with you with my re recent research about this, what are the possibilities of BIM to enhance our built heritage. Uh, so like all the other digital design tools, uh, BIM also comes with its own po potential. Like in 1990s, computer-aided design introduced us complex forms and parametric design. BIM also did the same from different aspects. So at this point, it is really important to understand these uh, possibilities to take advantage of this technology for enhancing in a better way uh, for, uh, to our uh, building, uh, historical buildings. So I made these five points, uh, which I think are really useful to integrate this technology into build heritage. Um, first one is integrated model, BIM. Sorry to interrupt, uh, I don't think we can see, uh, we just see the first okay. slide of your presentation. You I'm, don't uh, see it? Or? I only see the first one, I'm not sure if the rest. Okay, let me cor try to correct. Um, do you see the PowerPoint? Okay. Mm, now you should see. Oops. 
Sorry, I will try again. I think if you if you keep it maybe like this, we we, we should be able to see uh, through the presentation. Right now, do you see? Yes. Okay, I'll keep it like this then. Thank you. Um, okay, this was the second page that I talked about this CAD technology and BIM. And uh, we come to these five points, uh, the one integrated model, BIM being an integrated model with all the services of a real building, like plumbing to mechanical system to structural. So it brings lots of potential uh, in, in architecture. But also for our historic buildings, uh, the ones for uh, which are used today, for example, it's really useful to optimize their management, maintenance and protection also. Uh, my second point, you see, slide, you see the slide, yeah. It is about, um, more about modeling of built heritage. Uh, uh, it's about families in this BIM concept, which are the smallest components. Uh, they are parametric and adaptable. So like you see in this image, um, uh, they, they can, you, you don't need to model uh, every, each and every one of these walls in your model, uh, but you can have, it, have one family which can be adaptable in different conditions, like in, it can adapt its span, its height, um, anything you can uh, introduce this family. So it's a really e easy, easy way to model. My next uh, point is about storing data. In compared to CAD technologies, the BIM can store more data and it gives possibility to collect uh, all building data down to the smallest asset of, of the building. Uh, it means that mm, every data, uh, every component of the building can be stored in a model and reused inside or outside of this BIM environment. Um, my next point is about this outside aspect of this data which I think is really useful because it creates this different platforms for different people who wants to work on heritage, who wants to um, just enjoy heritage or participate. Um, it's really important because we can extract this data and use it in other platforms. Uh, like there are applications and experiments in gaming, in augmented reality, virtual reality, and also in facility management. And I can give you one example about facility management, which can which make it more concrete. Um, we can extract, extract this data in an Excel format from our BIM model, in, a, in an Excel format that is uh, standardized. So we can introduce this Excel uh, data into our browsers, like there are web applications, like this one in the picture, uh, spe specifically designed for facility management. So in in real time, uh, we can see we can see this PD on our browser with all the assets and all the data we acquired from our BIM model directly without doing anything else. And my my last point is about mass collaboration, which is a really important subject today. Uh, thanks to internet and social media and uh, wiki workplaces like Wikipedia, Wikidata. Uh, but yet, um, there is no common usage of this aspect in digital, um, in digital design tools yet. Uh, so, but there are experiments and I want to share one with you. It's called Project Zone. Uh, this is a project aimed to revitalize the lost work of uh, architect um, Sir John Sons, uh, Bank of England. Uh, it is aimed to use the original documents to, to revitalize this lost monument. So the Museum of Son opens their archives to, to public and hundreds of architects participated in this project. Uh, so they created this digital building in, in BIM, in, in BIM um, environment to uh, vitalize this building. And I, I find it really interesting. You can check the website if you're also interested. Um, and lastly, I will finish with some questions. 
Uh, first one, for example, I was thinking about, I was thinking when I was reading about the Swan project, uh, if um, what is the position of archives and museums uh, for the digitalization of building heritage, for example, or any other questions or uh, notes I can have. Thank you. This is the end. Thank you very much. Um, and then our last presenter will be Mina Hanna, who is an Egyptian architect, architectural photographer, um, and a recent graduate in uh, architectural design and history from uh, Politecnico di Milano, who will present uh, on photography um, as a tool for architecture and environmental heritage. Thank you, Phil, for the introduction. Um, so this is Mina. Today I'm going to be sharing with you some of my thoughts and work on architecture, photography, and heritage. So I hope you find them interesting and fun. Uh, uh, can you see? Okay, so as an introduction, I wanted to start with these slides uh, of John Ruskin. So you can reflect and at the same time to illustrate how photography was and still uh, a tool uh, in architectural documentation. So here, John Raskin was speaking to amateur photographers, uh, not to take just beautiful pictures, but also to be careful about every single details and trying to try different angles, angles and perspective in order to show um, the project itself or the monument. And by the time photography has successfully uh, showed itself as a portal tool for historians and architects, uh, architects because it provided them uh, with an accurate representation and detailed documentation uh, without any subjectivity. So for example, this guy you see now is Valotelu in 1847 during the restoration project of uh, the Notre Dame. He asked for many photographs to emphasize uh, the restoration work uh, and evaluate uh, the improvement uh, of the process. And I remember um, last year, um, when the fire happened uh, to the Notre Dame, my Facebook page was full of people uh, sharing renders and images how they imagine uh, the new Notre Dame. Uh, photography also expanded the scope for people to discover other styles, uh, traditions and cultures, uh, as the case, for example, in Egypt, uh, with pyramids and Sphinx, all that stuff. Uh, so, but the thing is, in Egypt, we don't only have pyramids and monuments and temples, we also have... I'm sorry to interrupt, Mina. Um, we have requests if you can please zoom in on the, the photographs I'm and sorry. if you can speak a bit louder so the people can hear you. Thank you. Is it better now? Yes, thanks. So, so in, this, uh, in this page, it's, um, it's uh, the entrance, uh, one of the monuments uh, during the Mamluk period. Uh, the art reached its peak and they delivered to us uh, one of their masterpiece, uh, Sultan Hassan Mosque, and this is one of uh, its entrances. The other one is uh, some of my works, uh, how I use photography in order to show architecture, heritage, or culture. So, for example, what you're seeing here are three different minutes from three different eras uh, in three different styles. The one on the right is uh, from Ottoman, uh, Fatimi, and Mamluk. And the other project is um, a series of street views uh, to showcase the urban situation in Mantua uh, through the architecture um, composition. Not only that, but uh, during the COVID, when the COVID started, uh, I wanted to show how the pandemic affected not only the people, but the city as a, a public space. Well, at the same time, uh, I didn't want to be just an individual working on all that. So I, I had my vision to become like this thing, become a platform or something more, just an individual work. Um, so yeah, I would say coming from rich cultural backgrounds of Egypt and India, Rahul and I, uh, both of us have a passion for documenting the heritage and cultural traditions through architecture. Uh, this path connected both of us in uh, another uh, rich architecture head of nation, uh, which is uh, Italy. So in UAP, 
uh, urban architecture photos my practice uh, we are not only documenting architecture and urban but also we aim to show heritage and i mean here uh, cities urban spaces architecture traditions and culture through photographs because we believe uh, in sharing knowledge it's not only about research articles or um, data analysis it could be art uh, as a simple photographic images uh, i also think this process uh, it makes it easier for people from other professions uh, to absorb or know more about their heritage and we have uh, examples like uh, travel bloggers or travel photographers they aspire to make people travel and see other cultures uh, through photograph so why we don't do the same uh, with heritage and make it easy for people to know more about their heritage or history or such things uh, this is another project uh, I was doing uh, for Aldorossi and now my friends for example in Egypt you know this is a cemetery uh, so yeah I think in today's world photography seems to be an attractive medium and tool so it's not only about architecture uh, showing and documenting architecture and heritage it could be something else that you're using in your profession so would be nice if uh, you can tell us how you think we can use photography uh, with you. Uh, you can reach us on LinkedIn, uh, sorry, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram on Urban Architecture Photos without any space, or just reach me on my Instagram page directly. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mina. Um, and thank you very much to, to all of our presenters. Uh, we're now going to proceed with the discussion. I think we have time for, for a few questions. So if you have any questions that you, would, that you would like our presenters to address, I suggest that you write your name in the chat box so I can call your name and you can pose your question. So this will be a good way so we can keep count uh, of how many questions we have and who is posing the questions. So yes, if you do have questions, please type up your name in the chat box uh, and the floor is yours. Um, hello, I, I, this is actually a question for several of the panel, but I love that Jeren spoke about the, the role of museums and libraries in preserving built heritage and because this is what Killian does, I thought it would be a good idea if you could address this. What, what are your thoughts? Oops. Uh, Carla, I missed just the beginning of that. Uh, you couldn't uh, just repeat what you said. Uh, yes, sir. So it was uh, Jeren at the end. She was uh, speaking about this project in which a museum was sort of replicating a, a building that had been destroyed. And she opened the question of what are the roles also of uh, libraries and museums to preserve this, this uh, built heritage, which doesn't fit in the museum, and how we can see this. Um, I, I thought it could be interesting that you probably have some point of view on this. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit. Um, I think um, it, it's just, I suppose, thinking about my own uh, perspective being in Ireland, there's a lot of um, built heritage and uh, different types of buildings that have been kind of used uh, for um, chapters in the past where there has been kind of trauma and violence and conflict. And some of those um, um, buildings are becoming kind of centers of learning and remembering the past, not celebrating, but like remembering the past and what happened and what maybe in some cases, what atrocities happened. Um, I think in, in Ireland at the moment, one of the, the big um, uh, projects, which is kind of like an international cooperation project, uh, goes back to the civil war in Ireland in 1922 and uh, the public uh, record office, which is basically the kind of National Archives of, of its day, was um, bombed and it exploded and uh, it destroyed about maybe all the records of kind of uh, British administration in Ireland going back maybe to the 13th century. And that was, uh, you know, I mean, Ireland is still kind of recovering from that in, in a way. 
Uh, but what has happened is that the uh, physical building that was destroyed, um, it was it was repaired and it still stands there today. But a lot of the the plans and drawings, the archit architectural plans, have been used now to kind of create a virtual uh, reconstruction of the the treasury room and the reading room and that and all the kind of sister uh, institutions, museums, national archives in Belfast, in London, and, and around the world, there's a kind of um, a repatriation of all the knowledge that was lost in the explosion and the fire. And what they're hoping to do, I can send a link to this uh, in a, just in a sec, but what they're hoping to do is that you would have a kind of uh, a virtual reality experience uh, as one part of it, but, but it would also be a kind of a, a resource, uh, a kind of a, a multifaceted resource whereby the knowledge uh, that was lost has been kind of digitally repatri repatriated from other uh, institutions and on that basis then uh, researchers and uh, people of Ireland and in, in the UK can kind of uh, think about uh, or basically find new meaning in what was lost and then think about the, the actual building itself uh, which can be seen there, but it's kind of it 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 provides a kind of uh, uh, a completely different purpose because it wasn't uh, rebuilt uh, in the same way in its entirety after 1922. So, um, sorry, I hope that answers the question. I was waffling it up there. Thank you very much. I think next we have Riley Marshall. Um, she has a question for Sarah. How are the buildings documented to develop the the beam models? Uh, any uh, any with any kind of survey uh, you can uh, have that information about the existing uh, building for with laser scanning uh, like Laura um, uh, Kira, Kira was uh, explaining with, with those methods or with traditional methods with any kind of uh, method you can have the data and then work you can work on it in these softwares working with B BIM principles. Yeah. Thank you, Seren. Um, I think we have some time for a few more questions. There was a question before for, about the laser scanning and whether this is safe for everybody, which maybe would be for Ana Chiara and Laura. Ah, right, yes. None. Yes, it, it's safe. Uh, it's a mm, very safe technique uh, for uh, humans, but also for the heritage. So uh, the laser scanning doesn't uh, uh, damage the surfaces. So uh, it's one of the the the, stand, the the static one is the one of the usual method to acquire uh, data from heritage or pre-existence. Thank you. Thank you, and I think we have a uh, Giovanni has a question too. Yes, sorry. Can I can I speak because uh, I have trouble writing my, my thoughts. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you very much for the brilliant uh, interventions. Um, I just wanted to like draw a line between um, Siren uh, and Mina and Nanda Chiara and Laura because we had these three. Um, small interventions about uh, basically uh, reality capturing through laser scanning, through BIM, and through photography. And so I wondered, do you have any perspectives in uh, sharing your data with an uh, open science license so that your data can communicate with other types of data, which can be either one of the three options that you have mentioned. So laser scanning, but also photogrammetry, ground penetrating radar, um, thermography, combining the, um, what can I say, like the visualization process, so, so the dissemination process and the conservation process. If that makes sense. <laughs> I think it, it's, it's probably more of a question for, for Siren, probably, because maybe BIM is more suitable for this kind of shared approaches in which you shared your data sets. And if maybe Europeana can be a good platform to host such kind of a project. 
Yes, I think, yeah, uh, good question. I believe there are lots of experiments happening. I'm constantly searching for it, um, but there is not just one option, like one place that we can share that there is not one platform. There are things happening. Um, for example, people are trying to create uh, some libraries uh, just devoted to this uh, historical beam objects, which every everyone can because creating these families, these objects is kind of um, it needs some kind of proficiency. But to use these softwares, you don't need that much pro proficiency. So with these libraries, uh, by sharing it, by putting it in, on open source, everyone can use this. Uh, objects and it, it can create easier modeling process, for example. Thank you, Seren. I think we have the last question from Yvonne, who is asking, uh, Seren is also for you, would you say it's difficult for someone with a uh, CH art historical background to learn how to construct HBI models and input data and where do we begin? Oh, actually, I I don't know because I am aware of this technology since I don't know nine years. So it is, was like I don't have any idea. I didn't learn it recently, so it was gradual learning. Uh, but I can't uh, make more comments. I think <laughs> I don't know. Okay, thank you, Steren. Um, I think that marks the end of, of our meeting. I don't know if Carlota, maybe you have any announcement or anything to say? No, good, okay. All right, thank you uh, very much to our presenters, to our keynote speaker. Thank you for everyone to help, um, that helped uh, in the realization of this event. Uh, we hope to see you soon uh, next month. Uh, please let us know if you have any questions and see you all in December. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.